Hello y'all, I am back and I am hotter than ever because it is 93 degrees Fahrenheit outside right now. You know how spring cleaning is a thing? And then you know how in 2020, the world kind of just fell apart and we descended into chaos and nothing was ever the same again. So welcome to Budget Eats. We're not doing spring cleaning, but we're doing summer cleaning edition. This week, I will be taking you through five days of cooking through the entirety of my kitchen stock. This means that we're gonna go through my pantry, my freezer, my fridge, and we're just gonna keep pulling things that are either expired, opened, unlabeled, or very questionably need to be thrown out. This means that we're not gonna be spending any money this week. We will simply be using what's already in my kitchen. Julia has stipulated that we are following a five-day rule. Yes, I know, a week has seven days. However, if I keep cooking for seven days, I might just melt under this heat. And it would also take Zach 10 years to edit instead of eight. This week, Aaron is far gone from this apartment, enjoying his own life. Yes, he has one of his own. And I don't have any taste testers. Except, I do have a new cat. Fred is a new addition to this household. He is about 10 years old. He has about three teeth left and he's very adorable. He also has asthma. Just like me, he loves mush food. I think we're soulmates. Lucky for me, Fred is not a picky eater. All right, y'all ready for this? Sorry, Fred. single piece of American cheese. I know you're angry at me. I know. I know. Okay, I'm done. I think. Given how much food I just found in my fridge, freezer, and upper pantry, I don't even think I'm gonna go into my other pantries. It's quite frightening, guys. I could probably live off of this thing for six months. All right then, let's take a look at our haul. It's physically impossible to put everything out here, but one quart of buttermilk, half a container of heavy cream, two pounds of yogurt left in a five pound container, jalapeno jar filled with condensed milk that was left over from our camping budget eats, one pound of frozen expired ricotta, eight ounces of farmer cheese, seven ounces of white cheese, one slice of American cheese, one and a half blocks of frozen tofu, five tomatoes, very much in need of cooking, one cup leftover canned tomato, some tomato paste, cornmeal, semolina, sticky black rice that Lena gifted me years ago and I really need to use right now, five very blackened burro bananas that I got on sale, five Cavendish bananas that are starting to go very ripe that I got on sale, eight ounces of dark roasted almonds, and by dark I mean borderline burnt, one small bag of frozen galangal that I took from the Delish Test Kitchen probably two years ago, panole flour, millet flour, teff grains, two and a half bags of random frozen fruits, five onions, some of which have been cut into for an onion taste test, link in the description, three heads garlic, one red bell pepper, one very wrinkly carrot, two leeks, five limes, a lot of greens, spinach, mint, scallion, cilantro, some small cut into shallots, one lot of ginger, 10 eggs, and an open bag of Gardein imitation beef grounds. And now we head into my leftovers. All last week, I was developing recipes for our new quarterly mag, which if you're not subscribed to, what are you doing? Have you seen these photos? Even if you don't cook, have you seen these photos? From my testing, I have leftover dumpling dough, some dumpling filling, some Romesco sauce, a lot of roasted red peppers, which I actually don't like to eat on its own, so that's gonna be tricky. Some heads of roasted garlic, and then we have really old shit. I don't know why I always have sourdough starter when I don't even bake sourdough bread. And now I'm gonna have to find some way to stick this all back in there. This week's Budget Eats will pay homage to our original Budget Eats, which was shot about a year ago on my cell phone, in which I spent 35 bucks for the entire week, three meals a day, plus snacks, whatever you want. That's how we're gonna swing it this time too. 
And I know I sound like a broken record, but please, it's hot outside, stay hydrated. I know a lot of you are gonna be like, June, you're not gonna eat these bananas, they're liquid. To which I say, girl, you know I am. I'm very excited to see just how bad they can be inside. Fred, are you ready? He's ready. That's not bad at all, guys. It's not even liquid. The magic of burrow bananas. It's so sweet. It's like basically banana syrup. What do you think, Fred? Do you want some? Bananas? Mushy bananas? I'm no banana expert, but compared to your normal run-of-the-mill Cavendish banana, these are a lot less sweet, which leads me to believe that that's why they're not quite liquefied yet. There's just not enough sugar to kind of melt. That signature banana-y fragrance is also a lot more toned down, which leads me to believe these could be very good in savory applications too. For now, we'll just slap a lid on it and put it in the fridge until we decide what to do with them. As for our Cavendish bananas, we're just gonna peel them, slice them, put them in containers, and freeze them. Especially in the summer, these will be great for breakfast smoothies. I'm gonna separate out these more ripe brown spots. These will be more syrupy and perfect in things like banana bread, pancakes, you name it. For this week, Julia has encouraged me to go for the weird. So uh, in terms of strange ingredients that I bought once upon a time because I was so curious and then never used it, I introduce to you pinole. Pinole is a form of roasted and then ground maize. Essentially, it's a corn powder, but it's often mixed with stuff like cocoa, flavorings, cinnamon, and then turned into a nutrient-dense drink or other stuff. It's often made into atole di pinole, and it's basically like a cooked corn beverage. Because it's summer, we ain't gonna do that. <laughs> However, I am thinking of blending it with a little bit of buttermilk and ice for a nice cold morning smoothie. As you can see, the pinole has a very gritty, grainy texture, and so in order to help it smooth out and bloom it a little bit, we'll be cooking a little bit of the pinole with some boiling water and cinnamon on the stovetop just to make sure it's a little bit hydrated. For sweetness, I think we're gonna go in with our jalapeno jar of condensed milk. Now, I know people don't usually drink buttermilk straight, but like... I wonder why. Does it taste bad? Tart. I highly recommend that you shake your buttermilk, but since this container is not really secure, I'm gonna pour it into a jar and then shake it after the lid is on. Is this expired? Oh, you betcha it is. As with all food things, pass the three step test. Look at it, does it look fine? Yes. Smell it, does it smell fine? Kinda, smells pretty good. Taste it, does it taste fine? Good enough to me. Mmm. Cinnamony, cocoa-y, corny, buttermilky. Breakfast. Refreshing. Let's add a touch of vanilla in there. Imagine you took a really good corn tortilla and you blended it with some horchata and then you put in some kefir. That's what this tastes like. It smells really nice and earthy and homey and hearty and it tastes really nicely tart with a little bit of sweetness floating in the background. The ice takes it to the next level because man, anything cold right now in this heat top. I'm gonna give this one a 7 out of 10. All right then, <sighs> on to lunch we go. Don't know about you, but I have this habit of wanting to eat the things that I like the least first. So I really want to do something with those roasted red bell peppers that I have 
absolutely no idea what to do with. Polenta, we're gonna take some butter. We're gonna brown our polenta with a little bit of spices. I'm gonna go in with a little bit of fennel seeds, maybe a little bit of five spice, ground coriander, smoked paprika, and just let those get all fragrant. I'm gonna pour in my water. I'm gonna let it boil until it's nice and creamy, and then I'm gonna splash in some cream to make it even richer. As for the roasted bell peppers, I'm gonna go ahead and blend them until it's nice and smooth, and then I'm gonna combine it with some of our roasted garlic and two of our very, very soft tomatoes, and we're just gonna cook it down into a sauce. Kind of tastes like salsa, actually. To give our polenta a salty kick, I'm gonna be using our steak seasoning, which has a lot of herbs in it alongside the salt. I know you're gonna be tempted, as I am, to walk away, put the lid on it, and just let it cook itself, but the bottom will burn if you don't stir it, so keep coming back and stirring it pretty frequently. Add more water as you see fit. If it looks like it's getting too stodgy, just drizzle on a little bit more. The thing about cooking mush like cornmeal is that it's totally dependent on personal taste. You like it looser, more liquid. You like it stodgier, less liquid. Easy. And this is why sometimes recipes just can't tell you the whole truth. I will just say I possibly chose the worst things to make on a 93 degree day. This will never reduce down to a sauce. Polenta on the other hand, looks pretty good. I also thought I had half a container of this. Uh, looks like I only have a quarter cup, so use sparingly, June. In the meantime, I'm gonna cut up some of our shallots, put them in a jar, put them with a little bit of sugar, salt, and vinegar, and give it a shake. These will be a nice quick pickle to go on top for crunch and acidity. About half an hour of feverishly bubbling away on the stove, our sauce resembles a sauce. When you're using your herbs, be sure to take the black leaves out first and use them cutting away the blackened edges first. If you leave them in the same container as your healthy herbs, they will kind of just contaminate the whole batch eventually. I will just say, it really does kind of feel lonely without Aaron here. But we must eat. Mmm. The pepper sauce is surprisingly acidic, which I guess shouldn't be that surprising because it was packaged and there was citric acid in that brine, but that provides a wonderfully acidic balance to that creamy, creamy polenta. And then with that cheese and the shallots, it's very punchy. I am personally a big fan of mush, so this bowl is very satisfying to me. And despite the fact that I am so sweaty, it is so hot, and this bowl is really, really too hot for a 93 degree day, I still like it a lot. That mild creaminess blends into the bite of the black pepper, and then all the spices kind of just disappear into a strange, harmonious acidity dance. Do we think Fred will approve? Do you like it? No interest. Given that Fred wasn't such a huge fan, I believe this doesn't deserve more than a 7.5, but I think it's actually really dang good. Hit it with a little more mint if you wanna pick up that acidity just a tad bit, and then enjoy, guys. We're gonna put our leftovers away and then we're gonna think very hard if we even wanna cook dinner because at this point, it's too damn hot. <sighs> okay, while I was doing my dishes, it occurred to me that I should make some banana nut muffins. And yes, I'm crazy because that would entail turning on my oven to bake, but what else are we gonna make with mushy bananas, guys? Besides, then we'll have dessert and breakfast tomorrow. Now, I know you guys hate it when I don't give you exact measurements and exact recipes, but I'm just gonna wing this muffin because it's too hot for me to think right now. And even if I don't write out the entire recipe for you, you just gotta look, guys. You just gotta look. 
All right, all right, I'm just joking. Here's the recipe. Three bananas mashed completely. Drizzle in a third of a cup condensed milk. Mix in a large egg. Three quarters teaspoon of salt or pumpkin pie spice salt. If you know, you know. And then a teaspoon of vanilla. Some toasted almonds, extremely finely ground, almost until it's butter, but not quite. And then we go in with our dries. A quarter cup of pinole, three tablespoons of millet flour, two tablespoons semolina, one tablespoon cornmeal, one tablespoon teff. Mix in your baking soda and your baking powder until evenly combined, then mix in your buttermilk. It should have a nice, smooth, but viscous consistency. Now, I don't recommend doing this if you're afraid of getting sick from raw eggs, but science. That's pretty sweet and delicious. I'm gonna preheat my oven to 350 degrees. I'm gonna take a leftover butter wrapper and just spread it all around my cups. I really pray to God these release from the cups. And then we'll portion about three tablespoons into each cup. If you don't want breaky, breaky muffins, let them cool in there for at least 10 minutes before trying to flip them out. If you have any stubborn muffins, just go very carefully around the edge with a offset spatula to help it release further. And you should be good to go with a gentle tap. It's nice and set on top, golden brown on sides and bottom. The inside is nice and moist, very nice loose crumb that still holds together with that very nice, slight gumminess. A vague scent of pumpkin pie spice and whatever spices were already in the pinole are shining through fantastically. The almonds have kind of merged themselves into the batter and it's just nice and earthy. You don't really taste the bitterness of the overly toasted almonds and you don't really taste the sugariness of either the bananas or the condensed milk. They're kind of just one now. The inside texture of these are kind of fascinating. They almost taste as moist as a fresh pancake. I'm willing to bet that these will taste even better tomorrow after they completely cool and rest and hydrate overnight. What do you think, Fred? Do you like it? Is that a no? No? For now, I'm gonna give these a solid seven. We'll see what tomorrow brings. Oh my God, it's so hot. That's okay. For dinner, I think we're gonna need some vegetables in our system. I'm thinking the spinach wasn't looking too great. I think we'll go ahead, rinse it off in cold water until all the grit is gone because spinach can be a gritty little mm -mm. And then I think we're gonna make a very simple, easy peasy dumpling vegetable soup. Dumpling vegetable soup. We have the dumpling dough already made and it's very old. At this point, I think it's been about a week since I made it and the dough has started turning a very strange color. It smells fine. It looks questionable, but uh, let's give it a shot, shall we? Tastes sweet enough to me. As for the filling, this is a bacon beef, which I substituted in Gardein and it's flavored with gochujang. And of course we can assemble these into proper dumplings, but ain't nobody got time for that today. What I'm gonna do instead is just take a quarter of this dough. We're gonna toss our board with a little bit of millet flour to prevent sticking. And then we'll just roll it out as thin as we can go without the dough breaking. If you got wonky pieces, don't worry about it. Welcome to the wonk. And there you have it, really ugly wontons.
just like dumplings, you can go ahead and freeze these before you boil or cook them and they will freeze perfectly well for you to reheat and boil when you're ready to eat them. If you do freeze them, be sure to layer them in a single layer because if you stack them, they will never ever come unstuck. To make our dumpling slash wonton soup, very simply, bring some water or broth if you have it up to a boil and then we're gonna slip in some ginger and garlic. We're gonna let that simmer until that water turns a slightly more yellowish color and then we're gonna slip in our carrots. Let the carrots cook for about four to five minutes until they're tender, crunchy, and then slip in your wontons, dumplings, what have you. Cook it for two to three minutes until they float. When the wontons are done, their skins should be semi-translucent and you should be able to see the filling through that dough. Turn the heat off, wilt in your spinach, give it a nice good stir, and then top it with some scallions. Because I have it on hand and I need to use it ASAP, I'm gonna put in some cilantro, but I know there's plenty of cilantro haters out there. Optional, of course. As with everything in these episodes, you know? If you have a little bit of sesame oil, we'll finish it off perfectly. Is it hot as hell? Yes. Am I hot as hell? Yes. Do you not see the sweat all over me? But this makes it all worth it. It's so comforting, even in the dead heat of summer. My mom used to tell me to eat super hot stuff so that it feels cooler around me. Is that scientific? Probably. I trust my mom. The vegetables are nice and tender, the carrots are soft, the galangal has basically melted into the soup with its nice woodsy herby vibe. The ginger has lost its kick and bite and the garlic is creamy. It makes for a very flavorful aromatic broth and then you hit it with a little bit of scallions and cilantro and then you take it all in one bite with that wonton. Some of my wontons did fall apart and basically lose its filling and flavor to the soup, but you know what? If you're gonna drink it all, it's flavor anyway going into the same place. The dough is nice and tender, slightly creamy, yet still with a little bit of chew at the thickest parts, and that nice gochujang filling really hitting the spot right now. Oh, wow. Dang, Simon Cowell. As for me, I'm gonna give this dish a 7.8. I think it's pretty decent. I probably should have salted the broth while everything was cooking so that the dough would have been infused with a little bit more flavor. But given everything, not bad, June. Not bad. I'm ready to throw in the towel for today. I... Uh, brain. What is? <laughs> Since February 2020, I've not yet eaten a single bite of cheesecake. And if you didn't know this, cheesecake is in my top five desserts of all time. If we strain out the moisture in our yogurt and our ricotta, maybe there's a chance we can attempt to give me a bite of cheesecake. I'm gonna set my strainers over a bowl with enough distance to collect liquid and not have the yogurt or the ricotta sit in it. Then I'm gonna line them with two layers of paper towel. The paper towels will prevent the dairy from actually falling through that strainer and will let the liquid just collect into the bowl. And if you're wondering how ricotta that's been expired for a year tastes after it's been defrosted, fine. Go ahead and set both of these in the fridge and we'll check in tomorrow. I think it's time to give Fred a treat. Yay. Fred gives yogurt a 10 out of 10. You all ready to sweat? Welcome to Tuesday. It's another scorcher here in New York City. Fred is slowly melting away at my door frame there and Let's start eating breakfast, shall we?
Keeping it simple and keeping it cool, let's make a smoothie. We have our frozen bananas from yesterday. We also have some whey that seeped out of the yogurt overnight that we can put into the smoothie. We have a lot of mint to go through, so let's put in some of that and uh, condensed milk. No recipes, just do what you like. To really avoid the struggle of detaching the pieces, you should probably freeze this in a single layer and then put them in a box. Cheers, buddy. The flavor is smooth, refreshing, sweet, and minty. It's so good to start my morning with this. If I could, I would drink this all day. It's a 10 out of 10 for me, baby. And for these banana muffins that we made yesterday, I ate four of them after we turned off the cameras and they are simply so much better when they're cold. It's nice and fudgy now. The flavors have all kind of melted together a little bit more. The textures are there, but less crumbly, and it's just very well hydrated throughout, making for a creamier bite. The burnt almond taste has almost turned into this mocha-esque coffee taste, and it brings me to like a fancy cafe that has financiers and croissants and all of those French things that are delicious and butter laden, except this one has no butter in it. Ratings for the muffins the day after, 8.5. I think before the day gets a little bit hotter, I wanna bake something because I wanna bake desserts all week long because we have those frozen fruits. I was looking forward to making cheesecake, but it looks like the ricotta hasn't quite drained enough. There's barely any liquid down there. So what I think I'm gonna do is place a weighted thing on top of this to help squeeze out more liquid. Maybe like our bananas that are now liquefying. So switching lanes, I think what we can do is make a cherry binole cake. I don't know how yet, but we're gonna figure it out. First things first, I think we're gonna have to melt these. Stove top, medium, heat, put them in there, let them melt, let them bubble up a little bit. We're not really trying to cook it down to a syrup, we're just trying to defrost the cherries. So turn off the heat when it's ready, and then squeeze in your lime. Nice and juicy, give it a taste, see if it's sweet enough for your baking needs. Okay, we're going to fish the cherries out and leave the liquid in, and then let me show you something I found in my freezer. So these are cherry pits that I've probably had for almost two years now. And um, I, uh, let's use them. The kernels of cherry pits inside the hard shell actually has trace amounts of toxic poisons to humans. So I would not recommend eating them straight. However, in many, many cuisines and cultures around the world, a lot of the kernels of pits are used as flavoring agents. So to avoid getting that toxic dose of poison, what I'm going to do is dump these kernels unshelled, AKA in their shell, because English is really confusing guys, into our cherry liquid. And we're going to just reduce it until that syrup is nice and thick. And the flavors of the cherry pit will have merged into that pot. In the meantime, we'll take our de-juiced cherries and we'll blitz it in our mini food processor so that we could use it as a puree in our cake. After our cherry juice has simmered for about 10 minutes, we're gonna turn off the heat and just let it steep in there. We're gonna grind up the rest of our almonds to use as fattening agent in this cake. Because I don't have anyone else to feed, I'm just gonna make four mini loaves. We're gonna take an egg, we're gonna separate it into a clean bowl. For the cake batter, you're going to take one egg yolk, whisk it with condensed milk, cherry mash, ground almonds, and then you're gonna put in some baking soda, baking powder, and a little bit of salt. You're gonna add in the dries, pinole, millet flour, and then you're gonna add in some wets, ricotta and buttermilk. Give that all a very good stir until everything's nice and combined, and then you're gonna preheat your oven to 350 degrees while you whip your egg whites. You wanna make sure that your oven is ready to go the moment your egg whites are ready because they will deflate if they sit too long. 
I like to go in with maybe about a third of the whites just to lighten it up a little bit first. And then we go in with the rest of it so that not all of it gets collapsed. Don't be too precious about it. It's okay if you have a little bit of pockets. Better this than to overmix. Oil your loaf pans, pour your batter in, slide it into the oven. And yes, I know it's a waste to be cooking this hot on a summer day with only too many cakes, but the heart wants what it wants sometimes. Set a timer for 15 minutes and we'll check back. After your cherry pit syrup has cooled off, go ahead and strain it out. At 15 minutes, check in. If the cakes still look a little bit soft and unset on top, slide it back in for about three more minutes. In the meantime, we're gonna make a little bit of a brushing liquid out of our condensed milk, our buttermilk, and a touch of heavy cream, plus our cherry syrup. We're gonna brush this onto the cakes just as they come out of the oven to ensure a nice, moist interior. You wanna almost make sure that you're oversaturating them as if this were a tres leches cake. We're gonna let those cakes cool because they'll taste way better once the soak has had time to actually sink in. And before Fred completely melts into the floor, let's make lunch. For lunch, I wanna take our leftover polenta from yesterday and make them into fritters. What do you think, Fred? Polenta fritters? This height difference is a lot harder to manage than one with Aaron. I'm thinking we'll slice them into fry-like shapes, coat them in a little bit of millet flour, sear it in a hot pan with some oil, and then season it with a little bit of salt and pepper. We're also gonna make a whipped white cheese dip and serve it along with a lot of my leftover romesco. Our white cheese sauce is gonna have white cheese, plus mint, plus salt, plus pepper, plus some buttermilk. I think for a little bit of health, we'll also need some greens, so let's make a spinach side salad. Very simply, I'm gonna chop up some spinach, slice up some onions, we're gonna toss it in a little bit of honey mustard dressing, also available in our quarterly mag coming up next, and I'm going to throw some of our pickled shallots on top as well. Top it with a little extra mint, let's go. When it comes to salads, my pet peeve are salads that make you look like an ogre when you're eating them. So I always like to chop up all of my ingredients to tiny little pieces. That way, if you need to, you can even use a spoon to eat your salad. Fred, Fred, are you okay? Buddy, do you want some water? Stay hydrated. How many times do I have to tell you? You gotta drink your water. You haven't touched your water at all, bro. They are not the most beautiful things that I've made, but they smell delicious. They smell like very toasty cornbread. The outside is nice and crackly crusty, and the inside is still gooey, ooey, moist, and creamy. This is why they lost a lot of shape. I think my polenta yesterday was very creamy, so it was very hard for them to maintain that fry shape. But what matters is on the inside, right? That's hot. Introducing our two sauces, my leftover experimental romesco plus a white cheese buttermilk mint sauce. This is kind of like a uh, yogurty ranch almost, I would say. Messy affair. That is dang good. That sauce, tangy, yogurty, cheesy, salty, minty, herby, refreshing, indulgent, all of the things. It's nice and thick. It's not really that runny, but it's just creamy enough that you're like, wow, this is a sexy bite. Unfortunately, the structural integrity of these polenta sticks are not very strong, but that's okay. That just means you gotta adapt and you gotta eat it for what it is, you know? Accept yourself where you are. This is pretty dang good. This is actually a really good textured bite. There's crushed nuts in there. There's kind of texture from the cornmeal and the polenta. There's the crispy edges that we fried into it. Mm. All in all, I'm pretty damn satisfied with this meal. Buttermilk, cheese, mint is a go, guys. Try this combo out if you haven't yet. It almost looks like fish sticks and tartar sauce. The romesco is nutty. The buttermilk sauce is nice and rich and tangy. 
and then you hit yourself with a slap of Honey Dijon. I was originally going to dock myself some points for the structural integrity or lack thereof on the corn sticks, but you know what? F*** it. I give myself a 10. Again, numbers are arbitrary. Make yourself happy. Give yourself whatever number you want. I do believe Simon Cowell back there is fully dead now, so we're not even going to bother him. It is currently very hot in my kitchen and literally everywhere around me. So we're gonna take a break. But before we break, I think I wanna make some tortillas for dinner. I think we're gonna take our pinole and we're just going to mix it with water and knead it until it forms a stiff ball of dough. Once I have a cohesive dough, I'm going to add in some millet flour. Pinole seems to be very, very crumbly and I don't think it can really survive being cooked as a tortilla. Once you have a nice round ball of dough like this, go ahead and slide it into a plastic container and keep it lidded until you're ready to use one to two hours from now. I think it's time to taste our cake. How adorable. How cute is this? It's got a very nice, even crumb structure. It's very moist, but also kind of grainy from the nuttiness of the almonds and all of the gluten-free flours that we put in here. It doesn't taste like the banana bread because this is cherry, but it does share a lot of the common textural similarities. What really sets this one apart though is the glaze. The cake itself is not very sweet, but you dabble on some of that extra glaze and it takes it to that perfect point between too sweet and just sweet enough. That makes you want more. It has a slight hint of cocoa-ness about it and it has a slight hint of that cherryness about it, but it's not very overwhelming in any one direction. I'm gonna give this an eight. As you know, condensed milk makes everything. Next stop, Mapo Tofu. Now you probably know of Mapo Tofu. It's a Sichuanese dish. It has a lot of delicious things with pork and tofu and spicy chili oil and all up in there. Mm. However, one of the most fundamental ingredients is doubanjiang, which I do not have. It's a fermented bean paste. So we're gonna have to scrounge around and find the next best thing. As far as fermented bean paste goes, I have this Korean bean paste that expired in October of 2020, and it has wheat flour, soybean, corn syrup, and lots of other delicious things. I think to go along with this, we can also add a little bit of oyster sauce, a little bit of hoisin sauce, and a little bit of this jar of miscellaneous chicken chili oil that I found in my fridge. We have this defrosted block of frozen silken tofu to use, and I'm gonna substitute in some Gardein beefless ground meat for the pork. By the way, did you know that you can plant scallions again to have them grow a second time? All right, to make our knockoff budget eats mapo tofu, we're going to chop up some garlic, some ginger, some shallots, some roasted red bell pepper. Yes, you heard me right. And then we're going to set aside some ground citron peppercorns and scallions. In a large pot over medium high heat, we're gonna heat up some oil. We're gonna throw all of those things in there, let them get nice and toasty for about 30 seconds, and then we're gonna go in with our bean paste. We're gonna swish that around until it's a little bit fragrant. We'll throw in our beef, our hoisin, our oyster, and a touch of condensed milk. While all of that is simmering, go ahead and drain your silken tofu. The key to squeezing out frozen tofu without breaking it too much is to apply even pressure across the entire block. Do you see the room for potential here? We're gonna add the tofu in, chopped into little pieces, and then we're going to add in some of my chicken fat chili oil. Add some water and just let it simmer and stir it around every so once in a while until everything's nice and delicious. And you know our golden rule, always be tasting. Spicy. I have a feeling Aaron would have loved this. In terms of mapo tofu, this is nowhere near the actual dish. The silken tofu that's usually used is not found here. 
the spongy little flavor absorber not at all the texture that is supposed to be in mapo tofu and this sweetness coming from the smoky red bell peppers doesn't belong here guess what though we're still gonna eat it do you want to bite fred what do you think that's a no this is a picky cat I do think it needs a little more flavor, so I'm gonna go in with a little bit of white pepper and also a squeeze of lime juice. Mm-hmm. The little squeeze of lime juice made everything pop a little bit, including the spice level, and the white pepper added a whole nother layer of nuance to that Sichuan pepper. I also feel like without the actual meat, be it real beef or pork in there, the browning and the flavoring just isn't the same. So I'm gonna toss in about a tablespoon and a half of ground almonds, and we're gonna mix it in and see what it does to the flavor. This is getting crazy, y'all. All right, let's make our tortillas. We're gonna put a ball of dough in between them. We're going to use our entire body weight and try to use a pot to smash down a tortilla to mimic the motion of a tortilla press. Very crackly dough. Not sure if we're gonna make it, guys. They seem okay, but do they taste okay? <gasps> wow, they can bend too. Check that out. They are cracking a little bit. I like that. It's so nice and earthy. Really nice texture. Crunchy and crusty on the outside, but still kind of soft and doughy on the inside. I know that a proper maize tortilla is supposed to lift with a slight separation in the layers, but this is not a proper tortilla. After they come out of your pan, stack them on a plate, put a nice towel over it, or maybe a pot lid or another bowl, whatever you want to keep that humidity in there so that they don't get dried out. To serve these, I'm gonna top our tacos, tacos, with a little bit more of cilantro, mint, as well as some of this sriracha peanut sauce that I developed last week, also in the next quarterly, guys. I hope you're ready for a butt, because I am. Would you say this is a taco, or is this sacrilegious? I feel like it's sacrilegious. I also feel like it's sacrilege to mapo tofu, but... Sometimes, sacrilege tastes good. These tortillas, I might pay money for them. Pinole is also very nutritionally dense. Even though we made 10 of these mini tortillas, I feel pretty full even after just one. The peanut sauce is so luxurious. It's insanely needed here because we don't have any like avocado crema or anything like that. So this is much needed richness. Combined with the mapo tofu, the textures are excellent and meaty and varied and very exciting. What a delicious mess. We might have to file this under things only June would eat, but in that case, June give this a 7.9. <clears throat> the heat will catch up to you though, beware. As for leftovers, we sure got a lot. Y'all, I went to do dishes and in the blink of an eye, it is going to storm outside. I'ma call it a day. I'll see you tomorrow. Fred. You know how sometimes you look at yourself and you think, wow, that was a dumb thing that I did when I was younger? Remember when I baked two cakes in a 350 degree oven yesterday on a 90 plus day? That was dumb. We're not gonna do that again today. I promise. To start our beautiful Wednesday morning off, we're going to feed Fred, we're gonna feed me with a berry smoothie, and then we'll think. In my morning smoothie, I'm gonna go in with some frozen bananas, a little bit more of our whey, some blueberries, and some of that cherry that we cooked off yesterday. She a thick one today. <laughs> How is it that before I even start, he's done? 
As you can see, a gorgeous color. It's creamy, it's smooth, it's silky, it's cold. I love everything about it. It's gonna be a scorcher today again, you guys. 10 out of 10. Now this, this is a look. The newest makeup trend of 2021. Next thing on our to-do list, soak that black sticky rice because that has got to be cooked this week. When cooking any type of sticky rice, I highly recommend that you hydrate it at least 30 minutes up to overnight, and then you can steam it. That way you don't get soggy sticky rice, you get perfect separate grains of sticky rice. Hydrating your rice this way makes it much easier to cook evenly throughout. I don't know about you, but I'm definitely ready for dessert and I really want to make that cheesecake. However, we are not baking today. So we're gonna try to make a no-bake cheesecake. So a very long time ago, Aaron bought me this packet of agar agar powder. It's a form of algae that's used as a vegan substitute for gelatin to set things. However, I find that it gives things slightly rubbery textures rather than a creamy set texture. Does that make sense? Given that I'm not a huge fan of it, I have a feeling I'm never going to use this if I don't use it now. So. Let's make some no-bake cheesecake with this. Package instructions says to mix one gram of agar agar with 120 grams of boiling water and include sugar. Hmm. Given that I have these sad limes I wanna use up, I think we're gonna try to boil that agar agar in some citrus juice and make a lime cheesecake. I'm gonna wash the limes carefully, dry them, we're gonna zest a few of them, then we're gonna juice all of them. In order to get the maximum amount of juice out of my limes, I like to stack two spent halves and press them again. This way you can yield some of that rind oil as well as more juice. And with four limes, I think we just about made it to 120 grams. In a small pot over medium low heat, I'm gonna combine our juice with a little bit of our zest as well as a teaspoon of agar agar. Sprinkle it in on top evenly and then whisk it in until completely dissolved. Agar agar does need to have a little bit of boiling action to activate it, so just bring that concoction up to a simmer and then shut the heat off. In the meantime, we're gonna take a little bit of what remains of our heavy whipping cream. We're gonna whip it until it's a soft, medium, almost stiff peak and then we're gonna refrigerate it to fold in as the last step. I'm gonna take some of our strained yogurt and I'm gonna combine it with some condensed milk as well as a little bit more of our lime zest. I'm gonna whisk that until it's really nice and smooth. Taste the batter, see if it's too sweet. If it's too sweet, perfect, because we're gonna be streaming in a lot of lime juice. If it's not too sweet, keep streaming in that condensed milk. We're gonna strain our lime juice mixture right over that bowl and we're going to fold it in gradually until that mixture is nice and set. I'm a little bit worried that one teaspoon agar agar wasn't quite enough. So I think I'm gonna melt in another teaspoon into our remaining lime juice. Then I'm gonna pour it into this condensed milk jar and swish it around so we can get the remaining bits of condensed milk out of there as well as cool down that lime juice mixture before we fold it into our cheese mixture. We're gonna fold in our whipped cream until it's evenly combined and then we're going to put it in these silicone cups that I've bought like four years ago and never used. Give them a little gentle tap, let it settle, put it in the fridge. Of the remaining batter, I'm also gonna to try to freeze some of them just to see what the textural difference is. I will just let you know that even if this doesn't turn out into a cheesecake, it's still delicious. All right, y'all, moving on to lunch. I'm thinking of a rice bowl with leeks and tofu and pickles and dressing. These are leeks that I bought almost two weeks ago. I was gonna use them for recipe development, but didn't use them. Now we're gonna use them for salad. 
One thing that you do have to know about cooking with leeks is that they can be very gritty, just like scallions. So I'm gonna trim off the bottom, the top, I'm going to have it, and then I'm gonna have it again, and then we'll rinse it many times until all the grit is gone. Please do not ever skimp on the washing process and please peel back all of the leaves to reveal all of the grit and make sure that you are washing it completely clean. Otherwise, there's a reason why you don't like leeks. I'm almost certain that if you left this task to my Chinese mother, she would let this soak for eight hours. But uh, I'm not my mom. Because the greens are a little more fibrous and tough, we're gonna go ahead and saute those first before we go in with our whites. So cut your whites and greens separately. Because leeks are already very flavorful, we're gonna keep the flavorings in this very simple. Large pot over medium heat, a little bit of oil, go in with a little bit of black pepper, coriander, and then throw in your greens of the leeks. Stir that around, give it a little hit of salt, stir it until it's nice and tender. If you see a lot of water seeping out, just turn up your heat and wait for that to evaporate. You want to get some browning on the green bits before you go in with the whites. Once your leek whites hit the pan, make sure that you're using that moisture coming off of them to scrape off the browning fond of the pot. This gets flavor into your dish as well as taking potential burn off of it. You're going to wait until this mixture is nice and caramelized and then you're going to turn off the heat and set it aside. In the meantime, we're going to drain our black sticky rice and steam it. Fill up a pot that fits your steamer, put about two cups of water in there, and then set it on a medium heat. When it comes up to a boil, lower it to a smaller heat, and then we're just going to let it cook until it's done. When your sticky black rice is done, the grains should be separate, but they should be completely mushy and very tender, chewy, and bouncy. For some protein, I'm going to go ahead and slice up some of our defrosted silken tofu and I'm going to throw it in a microwave safe bowl and microwave it because I don't really want to cook this tofu in a pot, I just want to make sure that all the germies are out of there. We're going to douse it with some of our peanut sauce and just let that marinate in. For our caramelized leeks, I'm going to take about half cup of it and then blend it with a quarter cup of white cheese along with a little bit of buttermilk to loosen it into a thick dressing. Nice and thick. And tangy. In order to loosen our leaky cheese sauce a little bit, I'm gonna drizzle in our drained ricotta liquid. Mix it until smooth and sexy. It's almost like a very creamy spinach dip, but with leeks. To assemble, we're gonna put some rice into our bowl. We're gonna drizzle it with our leek sauce. We're going to toss our tofu cubes perfectly marinated on top. Garnish it with the last of our roasted red bell peppers, hallelujah, a little bit of mint, a little bit of crushed almonds, and a little bit of our pickled shallots. I love it when you eat with your eyes first, you know? Yes. Give it to me. Okay, June. You go, girl. First of all, I just have to say, this is one of the most beautiful things I've ever made. Not only do I feel like I'm eating nutrition, I feel like my eyes are feasting on this glorious painting of a dish. And the flavors and the textures, they're all just so joyous together. They're clean, they're fresh, and they love to exist and be in my mouth. The nuttiness of the rice goes so well with the crunchy little bits of almond that's slightly burnt and slightly, slightly toasty. Just like, check out the flavor pockets on that tofu, my man. Look at it. Also, today I finally realized that mint, mint makes me feel like I'm a grown-up. So I highly recommend it if you want to feel more mature. I know that I've been inflating my own grades a little, as seen by a 10 out of 10 on the smoothie, but I think I'm going to give this one a 10 again just because it's delighted me to my core. Both visually and taste-wise, I think this one is a real winner. It's just beautiful inside and out. I'm also super glad that I have a lot for leftovers because I just realized that I have all day meetings back to back on Friday, which means I won't be able to cook anything. So this, this will be a pleasant lunch break for me then.
All right, y'all. Because I have all day meetings on Friday and won't be able to cook, I think what we're gonna do for dinner is a huge batch of bolognese. Bolognese? Bolognese? Language, it's all very confusing to me. It's gonna consist of a head of roasted garlic on top of raw garlic, on top of some shallots, on top of some onions, on top of all of the tomato products that we have. I'm also gonna pop in this red pepper sauce that we made from day one. Just, you know, it's red, it's delicious. It'll be fine. I'm gonna toss a hunk of carrot in there for some sweetness. We'll go in with two kinds of soy. One is gardein and one is crumbled, frozen and defrosted firm tofu. And finally, we'll go in with a little bit of ground almonds for that nice nutty richness. I'm gonna go ahead and use our pot from lunch because who wants to wash dishes on this kind of a day or any day? Nobody, that's who. Plus, it has all of that golden fond flavor on there. You don't wanna waste that, do you? Honestly, I'm not even gonna say what recipe I'm using because there are countless recipes for proper bolognese on the internet and you don't need mine, but I will just say, you know how a lot of chefs always tell you to have your mise en place before you start, AKA having all of your ingredients chopped and ready to go? Yeah, not so much for this one. It's gonna stew for a very long time, so what I'm gonna do is turn that pot to medium heat, drop in some oil, and just add to the pan as I chop my little aromatic vegetables. Give it a stir every now and then while I continue prepping the rest of the ingredients. If you're not nitpicky about technique when it comes to cooking and you just want some flavorful stewy type substance, this is a perfectly fine way to go and it will save you a lot of time. This is multitasking that an average person can actually handle beautifully. For the tofu, you know how we do. Press evenly to rid it of all of its moistures. To mimic the texture of ground beef, I'm just gonna go ahead and crumble some of this in by hand. Then finally, we'll add our ground meat. As always, give it a taste, make sure you like the seasoning, and then just let it simmer for as long as you can for all the flavors to bind together. For me, this needs a little bit of sugar, and so I think we're gonna go in with a little bit of our cooked cherries. The cherries can kind of substitute in for the wine that's usually found in some bolognese recipes, and I think I'm also gonna go in with the sauce that we made yesterday to compensate for the lack of dairy in our current version. Last but not least, we'll go in with our ground almonds for that nuttiness and fattiness. Naturally, to go with our ragu, we're gonna make some noodles out of our dumpling dough. I'm gonna use the last bit of the millet flour to flour my surface, and then we're gonna roll the sheet out as thin as possible and make your slices evenly across. Then shake the noodles to loosen them into a strand. Because we're making a small batch of noodle for one, a little bit of water will suffice. For fresh noodles like these, two to three minutes is more than enough for perfectly cooked noodles. Don't know about you, but I like a little bit of noodles with a lot of sauce. We're gonna give the noodles a nice little toss and then we're gonna top the whole thing with some mint leaves. And of course, what's a meal without some cheese? Finish it off with a little more black pepper and you got dinner. Pro tip, to make your pasta extra creamy, drizzle on a little bit of your pasta cooking liquid. This will help you emulsify the pasta when you mix it. Oh yeah, super comforting. I will admit, I overcooked the noodles a little bit because it's kind of hard to only cook noodles for two minutes when you're shooting it yourself and cooking and trying to narrate everything, but it still tastes pretty fantastic even though it's no longer al dente. Nice cheese, nice mint, nice sauce. What more can you ask for? In honor of Erin, I'm gonna drizzle on just a teensy bit of this prick nam pla. This is a super simple concoction of fish sauce and chilies, a little bit of lime juice and sugar, and I'll have the ratios in our next quarterly as well. Pungent. A little tiny touch goes a long way. That's it. All right, here we go. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. That really, that really takes it to the next level. With the addition of the chili juice, we're gonna have to give this one a nine out of 10. This is pure comfort in a bowl. It's four, I have to run to a meeting, but when I come back, we're gonna eat those cheesecakes. So we made this pretty first thing in the morning and it should have set by now because it's been six hours. However, it's not quite set, guys. Won't keep me from eating it though. I guess there is a possibility that it'll be more set by tomorrow, but I doubt it. As is though, it's like a pretty thick yogurt, which is what we started with. I would say as far as texture goes, this was a moderate fail. It certainly isn't cake-like, like cheesecake, but it is very enjoyable. If I closed my eyes and didn't know what color this was, I'd almost say that this was a key lime pie curd. It's as smooth and as thick and viscous as curd, and it tastes just sweet and tangy enough the same way curd would. The mouthfeel is very pleasant, for the most part pretty smooth, although I do feel like there's a bit of zest in there that's giving me a slight texture. As you can see, I licked it clean because I love it. I probably should have used a little bit more agar agar to really set that intense amount of filling, but we still have those frozen ones. I wonder what they taste like. I have a feeling these are gonna be a little bit shardy because there's just not quite enough cream in our concoction to not have shardiness. However, you get to see the design I was going for. It's slightly fluted, really beautiful, really nicely set, and man, is it burning my hands with cold right now. Mmm. So yes, there definitely is a little bit of iciness, but it's not like that kind of crunchy ice where you're like, ooh, what is that in my frozen treat? This is actually quite enjoyable, and the flavor is like a really good froyo. This would have been a great popsicle. Despite the less than perfect and less than ideal texture, I love everything about this. It's simple, it's pure, it's got that nice yogurty tang with that nice sweetness from the condensed milk and the limey fragrance running throughout it all. I'm gonna give this one a 9.5 out of 10, baby. My God, what a successful day. Good morning, y'all. Day four, Fred has woken me up since 5 a.m. So uh, before it gets too hot today, let's bake some dessert. In terms of the flours that we have left, we have a little bit of cornmeal, a little bit of teff, and a very tiny amount of semolina. And what I think we'll do is grind all of these up in the Vitamix so that we have flours, finer flours, you know, for a moister cake. Fred, what are you doing? It's not breakfast time yet. I don't know how many times we have to say this. Why are you wake me up so early? I know you're not starving. Fred, it's gonna get really loud in here, buddy. You might wanna run now. All right. Now that we have our flowers, let's rock and roll with this trash peach cake. We've officially used up all of our sweetened condensed milk, so I have no sweetener now, except I have all these random jams, jellies, caramels, failed caramels, and also that cherry liquid. In addition, we also have those very sad bananas. They smell so boozy right now. <laughs> First things first, I'm gonna blend up some of this blood orange marmalade with some of this apple syrup so that we have a more even smooth consistency. Give it a taste. Ooh, sharp. Given that I have a super apple citrusy syrup to use, I don't think I'm gonna combine the caramel, which has a more smoky, chocolatey flavor to it. Instead, what I think I'll do is make a banana caramel cake and then a peach citrus cake. It's your lucky day, y'all. It's a twofer. And boy, oh boy, is that gonna be mad about this. For our fat and creaminess, we're gonna be using our strained ricotta. To make the cake, 
Take your strained ricotta and mix it with one large egg. Then stream in your apple syrup and orange marm concoction with a pinch of salt. Stream in a little bit of vanilla. Stir in a little bit of baking powder, baking soda, and then go in with your cornmeal and a touch of semolina. We're going to put a little bit of sugar in there as well to help it caramelize. Then we're going to place some peach segments on the bottom of every cup. Go ahead and drop a little more sugar on top for extra sweetness and a little bit of crunchy texture. Turn your oven to 350. We're gonna slide it in there until hopefully it bakes nice and golden. For your banana cakes, take two of your very ripe, mushy bananas and mush them to mush. Stream in your caramel, your ricotta, and then give it a whisk. Whisk in baking powder, baking soda, and then fold in some fine semolina along with teff flour. Top with some ground almonds along with some mold and salt and throw it into the 350 oven. Let the peach cakes cool for about 10 minutes and then gently flip it onto a tray to reveal your upside down fruit cakes. To ensure the cleanest release ever, it's always a good idea to run along the edges with your offset spat. Not all of them came out perfectly, but you know what? Nothing in life ever really do. You just fake it, and then you show people the prettiest ones, and you don't tell them about the rest. That's how the professionals do it anyway. It looks beautiful on top and beautiful on the bottom. And to be honest, the crumb isn't too bad. I think I overbaked it a little bit because it is a little bit dry, almost like a cornbread consistency. However, that's nothing a little syrup can't help. We can just take a little bit of our remaining apple syrup concoction, mix it with a little bit of our cherry liquor, and brush it right on top. Much better. You know what would make this even better? It's a little more cheese. Mm. Yes. A smear of cheese, a little dollop of syrup makes this bite complete. It feels all very wholesome. I'm gonna give this one an eight. Same thing with the banana caramel muffins. Let them cool a little bit, run your offset along the edges, and then flip. As for these little guys, well, they look just adorable, don't they? These look a lot moister. That banana really does it for you. It smells vaguely like a bran muffin. Mmm. Oh my god. That texture is amazing. Perfect moistness. It's already delicious, but who can resist when you have caramel on hand of drizzling even more caramel on top? Not I. I will not resist this temptation. Mmm. That's a sexy bite, ladies and gentlemen. Holy schmoes, I'm entranced. We must have another. This, this is what life is for. I'm in love. I'm in love. I am in love. This tastes like a bran muffin crossed with a molasses cake, crossed with salted caramel divinity. Are you looking at it? Because it's perfect. This is possibly perfect. I think if we wanted this to be a more punchier straight dessert, we would have added a little more sugar to it, but I used all the caramel that I wanted to use in there. A lot of Chinese people will love this one because it's not too sweet. As for everyone who likes their desserts, 
high up to sugar heaven, you might need to drizzle just a little more caramel on here like I have. You know what? No, screw it. 10, 10. I was so happy. I was so in love. That's a 10. It looks like it came out of a freaking bakery. I can do this all day, Zach. I can do this all day. Wow. Now, let's think about lunch. All right, y'all, because we just ate a lot of breads and cakes, we're gonna keep lunch pretty simple and light. I found in my fridge this little container of miso that's been expired and it's just waiting to be put out of its misery. We have some tofu, we have some carrots, we have some spinach, some galangal and ginger. I say we make some miso soup. And it's pretty perfect that I just happen to have two small pieces of kelp left. This is as easy as it goes. You chop up all your veggies, you put some water, dissolve the miso, put in your kelp, put in your veggies, let it stew until everything's nice and tender or crunchy as you like it, and you drink it. For this miso soup, I'm gonna drop in the kelp first along with the galangal and the ginger. Once the kelp is nice and softened, I'm gonna fish it out and then I'm gonna chop it into bite-sized pieces. We're gonna put that back in and then we can put in our miso and stir until it's dissolved. Once that's all nice and combined, we'll go in with all of our veggies at once. You wanna hold the spinach until the very last thing. I only put in spinach to wilt after the heat has already been off. Otherwise, you might overcook those green leaves. My favorite way to wilt greens is to put them at the bottom of my bowl and then pour the hot stuff over it. That way, it can cool down your soup as it gets cooked. Mmm, smells vaguely like fermented soybeans, which is exactly what miso is. It's light, it's soothing, it's healthful with a lot of veggies and a little bit of protein. It's kind of like a hot salad and a lot of dressing. Is that essentially what soups are? The tofu are like little sponges of flavor and juice. The seaweed is nice and slithery and tender. The spinach is well wilted and the carrots are nice and crunchy. I think I just miss Erin a lot, but I want to add something spicy to it. I just feel like it needs a little bit of oomph, you know? Let's see what it does. Maybe it can work its magic yet again. It did, and you know what? I want a little more. Sometimes all you need is a little bit of chili and stanky fish. Mm-hmm. It's super low effort, super comforting, super fast, and super filling. I'm gonna give this one a 7.2. For dinner, I think we're gonna have to use up that dumpling dough. I think we're gonna have to make dumplings. And I think we're gonna have to make Romesco dumplings and Boyanese dumplings. Yes, I realize we're basically just repackaging last night's dinner into a different form, but you know, whatever. As long as it tastes good, does anything else really matter? Because I don't want to spend the rest of my life crimping dumplings, we're gonna make some big dumplings. I'm also thinking we'll pan sear these for like a little bit of a pot sticker vibe. I'm going to roll the dough into a log and cut the log into six even pieces. Then I'm gonna squish each piece with the heel of my palm cut side down on the board. That's gonna give you a form that's close to a round, and then all you do is take your rolling pin and turn that round often for a more even circle in the end. If you're working during the summer or on an especially hot day, it's really important to keep your doughs well floured so that they don't stick and get gunky. They can't all be winners. These are possibly the biggest dumplings I've ever made. <laughs> it's like a quarter of my face. Maybe more, I have a big face though. We're gonna shallow fry these babies up, medium heat, cast iron skillet, a lot of oil, 
When you see a bubble happening, that means it's cooking on the inside. The edges should start to look a little bit brown. Go ahead and give it a flip. Gentle, gentle flip. Go until they're both golden on all sides, and then we're gonna serve it with a yogurt mint sauce. And by yogurt, I mean buttermilk and white cheese. Will you guys give me extra points if I do this? $23. You really can't beat fried dough in any, any cuisine. Fried dough. Oh my God. Can I just say that the textures are on point? Shatteringly crisp on the outside. Tender and doughy and kind of chewy on the inside. Mushtastic on the filling. And then you have the mint sauce. Mm. There's sweetness, there's herbaliness, there's spiciness, there's nuttiness, there's crunchy, there's chewy, there's mushy, there's tender. <gasps> I truly don't know why I have not been using mint like this in my life, but after this episode, mint is going to be a staple favorite herb in my household. This is more than just the sum of its parts. This is magic. A ton. A ton. I don't know how I did it, but I did it. I exceeded my own expectations. It's time for a reward. This is amazing. I've attained happiness. Because I won't be cooking tomorrow, because I'm in meetings all day, I think what I'll do is mix a little bit of this teff with a little bit of flour and try to see if we can get like a slight sourdough thing going. Teff is most frequently used in Ethiopian cuisine to make injera, which is a kind of sourdough leavened bread. And the only two ingredients are teff and water. So uh, let's give it a try, shall we? I don't really know what amount to use. So we'll just play it by ear. I'll go in with about 50 grams or 65 grams. <laughs> That'll work too. And Maybe an equal amount of water. And I'll see you guys in two days. It's 4.15, I just finished all of my meetings for the day, and I'm pretty damn hungry. I think we need to cook something. Because I'm pretty wiped out from all the meetings, we're gonna keep it simple. We have the leftover tortillas, we have some onions, we have some bell peppers, we have some leftover leek. We can just toss those all together and try to make like a vegetarian fajita of sorts. Throw a couple of eggs on the pan, toss in this really sad slice of American cheese, dinner or more like lunner, because I have miso soup for lunch. Is that even lunch? I'm also gonna put the rest of our galangal out of its misery. It's looking pretty worse for wear. We're going to strip it of its skin and just try to salvage what we can and plop it in there. Galangal has a nice little spicy hint and earthy hint to it, so it'll do very nicely with our pinole tortillas. A little bit of oil in the pan over medium heat. Let those cook until they're nice and golden and slightly caramelized. 
a little salt, a little pepper, maybe a little taco seasoning. And then we'll go in with our leftover leeks. Fold to combine, and once they're nice and tender, move them off the pan, a little more oil, plop in our eggs, let those cook, and then we can warm up our tortillas in that leftover flavorful cast iron skillet. Toasting the tortillas, once the first side is warm, I flip it to the second side and then we'll top it with some American cheese. Oh yeah. Trash fajitas, here we come. Once the cheese is nice and melty, go ahead and assemble your mini fajitas. However you want, a little bit of egg, a little bit of vegetables, a little bit of cilantro, maybe pickled shallots, maybe a drizzle of peanut sauce. Trash fajitas. This could become a regular thing. Not gonna lie, I'm so tired. I'm not even gonna plate these guys. They're just coming straight off of the hot pan. This is a bad idea, this is a bad idea. Ah, that's hot. Better idea. Plates. Mmm. It somehow works. The egg is delicious. It is possibly the messiest thing ever to eat because everything's falling out all over the place from the mini tortillas. But man, the creamy yolk of the eggs paired with that spicy peanut sauce makes it super creamy. Then you have that earthy pinole wrapper tortilla thingy majiggy set against the crunchy sharp acidity of the shallots. Hold on, I need another one. Yes, please give me more. Can we just um, say hallelujah to that great American processed cheese? It is, it is, it just is. <coughs> That's something that you want to marry. This one is a 10. For ease, for flavor, for texture, for satisfaction, for surprise factor, for how random chaos and chance and luck sometimes in life will get you exactly what you need. And you know what? Best of all, it came together in like 25 minutes. Tomorrow, I'll see you for a fresh, bright, full Saturday. We're gonna try a day without blush or makeup. Yeah, Fred. And people who wanna police my face can come at me in the comments. Final day, yes, I do believe I'm breaking Julia's rule of five days only. However, rules were made to be broken, Julia. Before we make breakfast, however, I would like to report on some very sad news. Remember our Tef starter that we did on Thursday? Well, it's moldy, guys. There's little white fuzzies all over that surface. Now normally, I would probably just scrape the top surface mold off and use the rest of it, but because this is a show for you guys, I don't wanna promote that kind of dangerous behavior, and so I'm just gonna say we're gonna compost this. It's really sad for me. I almost never throw things away, and this hurts so much. Even the bird outside is judging me. You know what though? This gives us a great opportunity to use that sourdough discard that is probably very old. But let's not get too far ahead of ourselves because breakfast, smoothie. We're gonna use up that leftover frozen banana. We're gonna combine it with some of my foraged mulberries that have been sitting in the fridge and water for a very long time. I found these mulberries on the New York City streets so I decided to uh, soak them a little bit but now we got like mulberry wine going on here. <laughs> They're really pretty though. Sorry, I'm just kind of disgusting today. Okay, let's take a bite. Oh yeah. It is cold indeed. Nice and soft, a little bit like a smoothie, a little bit like a soft serve that's melting. There's little seeds from the mulberries, not quite as crunchy as blackberry seeds, and also not quite as tart as blackberry seeds, 
but delicious nonetheless. If you've never had mulberries, they are a treat and they're free on the streets of New York. I get a slight creaminess from the mulberries. I get a slight tart sweetness from the blueberries. You can really taste the bananas and you can definitely really taste the spirulina, which if you're not a fan of green algae flavor, this bowl is probably not for you. It is a very fun color though. This, this gets a 6.5. Fred. Fred, I'm trying to shoot a cooking video here, bud. This is why the health department doesn't want you guys in here. Alrighty guys, for lunchy brunch, we're gonna make a shakshuka, but with romesco, and we're gonna try to use up this last cornmeal to make a little cornbread -y thingy to dip into our shakshuka. That sounds like a plan to me. For the cornbread, we're gonna mix a little bit of olive oil, a little bit of farmer cheese, one egg, some baking powder, a little bit of salt, and I'll probably throw in some black pepper. We're gonna mix it all together until it's nice and smooth, and then we'll fold in our cornmeal. I think we'll also go in with some scallions just for a little bit of herby freshness and punch. Now, I'm definitely not gonna turn on the oven for this little amount of cornbread because we did that with muffins and we're not doing that again. So instead, what I think I'm gonna do is put it on the stove top in a cast iron skillet, mildly oiled, and then we're gonna top a lid to trap the steam and to see if it can cook purely on the stove top. We're gonna do this over fairly low heat so that the heating is gradual and the cornbread does not burn on the bottom. To give the cornbread a little more intrigue, we're gonna sprinkle a little bit of sesame seeds on the very bottom of this cake. We're gonna slowly push the cake into a round as much as we can. And then once the bottom is set, we can slap a lid on top. In the meantime, we're gonna prep our veggies for the shakshuka very simply. A small onion, a lot of garlic, we're gonna toss those into a oiled small skillet and caramelize them, stirring frequently. When the cornbread looks like it's starting to set on top, we're gonna flip it so that both sides can get a little bit of a golden brown action. It's like a big pancake. If your romesco is super thick, go ahead and thin it out with water so that you have enough moisture to cook off while the eggs are cooking. We want the eggs to have set whites and runny yolks. As for the cornbread, once both sides are golden brown, we're gonna unlid it and we're going to toast it on both sides until it feels like it's crispy. For this part, you can turn up the heat. If you see one egg cooking faster than the other, just go ahead and move your pan on the stove to direct the heat over the uncooked one. I turned off the heat because I smelled some burning. I threw some cilantro on there, and we're gonna see how it tastes. The egg is just barely set back there, and that one is definitely set. Our cornbread looks pretty dang decent. Nice golden bottoms and tops with that sesame seed embedded in there. And it looks like it's cooked all the way through. I love that I can see little specks of scallion and cheese everywhere in there. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, that's nice. Nice salty vibes combined with that dairy creaminess along with that kind of like curved spicy herbiness of the scallions. Because we put one whole egg in there, this kind of tastes like a crossover between an omelet and cornbread, and it's really nice and rich. And now, we dip. That is such a good combo. Is the bottom a little burnt? Yeah. Is that a little flavor? Yeah. Should I eat all the burnt crust? No. But what I can eat on top is pretty dang delicious, guys. You can even go ahead and make yourself a little shakshuka sandwich. Kinda like a sloppy joe. 
I will just say, I think I diluted the nuttiness of that romesco too much, so I'm gonna add on a little bit of our peanut sauce. When in doubt, slap on a condiment. Now we're in business. I think on its own, the shakshuka would have gotten like a 6.7 out of me, but with the peanut sauce, it's an 8.5. Peanut sauce is amazing. All right, y'all, it's time for our final meal. In terms of our raw ingredients, our major players are one really disgusting banana, some peaches, onions, scallions, cheese, teff, and one egg. We also still have a little bit of our toasted almonds that we can use in something. As always, my mind goes to dessert first, and I think for peaches, we can cook it down with our remaining cherry syrup and serve it over some farmer's cheese, which is relatively unsalty. So it could just be like a peaches and cream situation. In our small pan, medium heat, just dump both of those things in, stir it pretty frequently so that it doesn't burn on the bottom like it did for the shakshuka and then go until it's nice and jammy. Take it off the heat, let it cool, and serve with your cheese. In the meantime, we're gonna combine our sourdough starter discard with our tep flour, add a little bit of water, as well as a little bit of baking powder. And we're gonna plop in that egg, give that a whisk, season it with a little bit of salt, go until smooth, and we have a tef pancake batter. I'm going for like a crepe-like batter consistency here, so if you need to add a little more water, depending on the starter discard that you used, go ahead and just make it until it's drizzleable. We're gonna let this pancake batter sit, and then we're gonna caramelize some of our onions. And don't mind the noise, it's not a ghost, it's not a monster, it's not the end of the world, it's just a new neighbor moving in upstairs. Caramelized onion, fairly simple, slice them thin, throw them in an oiled skillet, add some salt and pepper in there. The salt will help you draw out that moisture and it will help caramelize the onions a little bit faster. I'm gonna be also adding in our remaining shallots as well as some of our scallions. To caramelize onions properly, you should be going at a medium low heat for a very long time. Now, if you're impatient and you have a lot of onions in a very small pan like I do, crank up the heat and just stir very frequently to make sure no burning is happening. Once your moisture is mostly driven off and there's no watery puddles on the bottom of the pan, then turn down the heat and keep stirring as well. When the caramelized onions get close to being done, we're gonna slip in all of our roasted garlic. In the meantime, I think we're gonna make a sauce with this disgusting banana. I wanna cook it with some black pepper, maybe a little bit of our almonds, as well as this expired instant coffee that actually doesn't taste half bad. It did, however, expire in October 29th, 20 something. Nobody will know now. I'm imagining it to be a little bit sweet, a little bit savory, and a little bit weird. not having a good day with the burns, huh? Yikes. As for this banana thingy majiggy that we made, I'm not sure how I feel about it. I can taste the coffee, but it's a little bit accurate. The banana is a little bit fermenty and alcoholic. And overall, this is just very strong. I think the only way to fix it is to go even strong. A little bit of sugar, a little bit of cream, and a little bit of alcohol. Yes. I believe we have just made Queen's first alcoholic caffeinated banana jam. Tastes like brunch. This gives me a little bit of banana Foster's vibe and a little bit of Irish coffee vibe, and it's honestly perfect. Oakley doakley, pancake time. Make sure there's no oil sitting on the bottom of the pan or else that will cause a lot of splattering. We're waiting to see some bubbles on the surface and for the edges to look a little bit more dry and matte and then we're gonna flip it. Once both sides look a little bit golden and it feels like there's a little more bounce to it, 
I think before we continue with the others, we simply have to taste this one to see if it's absolutely disgusting. I don't know if you can see, but there's tiny little holes that's letting in through light. That's pretty cool. It smells vaguely like whole wheat flour. Not a lot of sourdough smell at all, actually. And it's wonderfully spongy and rather tasteless. Which is gonna be great as a vessel to hold all of our fillings. We have our peaches. We have our banana jam. We have some almonds. We have cilantro. We have a lot of spreads, including more romesco. Peanut sauce. We have our leek sauce. We have two different kinds of cheeses. We have a little bit of spinach. We have a lot of bouillonnaise. And there's more pickle shallots and other condiments in the fridge that I cannot list right now because it's just too much. There's too much. All you have to do is choose your own fillings, wrap it up, and enjoy. For my savory pancakey and jira knockoff, I have a layer of farmer's cheese, a layer of romesco, our leek sauce, some spinach, caramelized onions, a little bit of our peanut sauce and cilantro, as well as more white cheese. It looks pretty dang good, guys. You gotta give it to me. I am the queen of trashy meals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know how I do it every time, but it never ends up tasting that bad, despite it just being 100% leftovers. But I'm pretty proud of this one, guys. It's pretty dang good. You got the sweet and spicy peanut sauce kicking it together with that caramelized onion vibe. Then you have the slight crunch of the spinach, along with that wrap and all the creamy sauces inside. It's a really nice textural contrast. If you ever want a wrap inception, you can wrap your wrap inside spinach leaves. Spinach on the inside, spinach on the outside. Is June crazy? I love it. As for dessert, I think it's simply breathtaking. Look at that. Look at that glazy goodness. Cherry, peach, Mint, airplanes, yet again. The colors are so beautiful here, but does it taste good? Sure does, folks. Sure does. When paired with the fruit here, the Teff pancakes start to take on a very rye-like flavor. It pairs really nicely with the farmer cheese and it gives it sort of like a uh, bagel, bagel vibe. So sweet, soft, pancakey bagel. As for our drugged out banana crepe, nothing to do but to try it. Hmm, that works. <laughs> Ooh, and I can feel the Baileys inside me already. <sighs> if you like bananas and you like brunch, and you like boozy, boozy meals, you're gonna like this one. Before I get too drunk, I'm gonna give you an 8.5. The tanginess of the banana works really well with the farmer's cheese, works really well with the slight background sourdough tang, and then it binds together with the natural sweetness of the bananas and the bitterness of coffee. Sorry. It's sitting right now. I think overall these sourdough teff pancakes, whatever you want to call them, oh god, it's cool, I'm good. Hi, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for watching Budget Eats. Yes. <sighs> Ladies and gents, this is why I don't drink. Um, I'm gonna clean up, but in the meantime, thank you so much for watching Budget Eats and let me know what meal you thought was the most delicious. And let me know if you try out any of these recipes and let me know if you love to see Fred more. And uh, that's it. I think we're done, right? Bye.